morning. So far in our Advent series on journeys to Jesus, we've looked at some of the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus and the genealogies found in Matthew and Luke. Today we're looking at the announcements of Jesus's birth. In his gospel, following the appearance of an angel to Joseph in a dream, Matthew notes that all this took place to fulfil what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. But this prophecy was not, of course, fulfilled in quite the way that most people at the time had expected. Max Lucado imagines what Gabriel might have thought of it all. Gabriel must have scratched his head at this one. He wasn't one to question his God-given missions. Sending fire and dividing seas were all in an eternity's work for this angel. When God sent, Gabriel went. And when word got out that God was to become a man, Gabriel was enthused. He could envision the moment, the Messiah in a blazing chariot, the king descending on a fiery cloud, an explosion of light from which the Messiah would emerge. That's what he expected. What he never expected, however, with a slip of paper, with a Nazarene address. God will become a baby, it read. Tell the mother to name the child Jesus and tell her not to be afraid. Gabriel was never one to question, but this time he had to wonder. God will become a baby, Gabriel. God will become a baby. Gabriel remembered what baby Moses looked like. That's okay for humans, but God... The heavens can't contain him. How could a body? Besides, have you seen what comes out of those babies? Hardly befitting for the creator of the universe. To imagine a mother burping God on her shoulder. Why, that was beyond what even an angel could imagine. And what of this name, Jesus? Such a common name. There's a Jesus in every cul-de-sac. Come on, even Gabriel had more punch in it than Jesus. Call the baby eminence, or majesty, or heaven sent. Anything but Jesus. So Gabriel scratched his head. But he had the orders. Take the message to Mary. Must be a special girl, he assumed as he travelled. But one peep told him Mary was no queen. The mother to be of God was not regal. She was a Jewish peasant who'd barely outgrown her acne and her crush on a guy named Joe. And speaking of Joe, what does this fellow know? He's a carpenter. Look at him over there, sawdust in his beard and nail apron upon his waist. You're telling me God is going to have dinner every night with common labourer and call this guy dad? It was all Gabriel could do to keep from turning back. This is a peculiar idea you have, God, he must have muttered to himself. Only heaven knows how long Gabriel fluttered above Mary before he took a breath and broke the news. But he did. He told her the name, the plan, and not to be afraid. And when he announced with God nothing is impossible, he said it as much for himself as for her. I'm sure Gabriel wasn't the only one to be surprised by God's plan to come to earth as a helpless baby to be born the son of an unknown Jewish peasant girl, betrothed to a carpenter. And God's plan must, of course, have come as an even bigger shock to Mary herself. There were many ways in which the details of the announcements of Jesus' birth were unexpected, even though they were all part of God's plan from the start. First, the birth announcement of Jesus does not take place where you would expect it to. Surely the announcement of the birth of the coming Messiah should be made somewhere significant, such as the temple in Jerusalem, the centre of the Jewish world, where the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist was made to Zechariah. <clears throat> Yet the announcement of Jesus' birth was made in Nazareth, an obscure agricultural village in Galilee, not even in Judea, with an estimated population of about 450 a place with such a poor reputation that in John's Gospel, Nathaniel is recorded as saying, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? 
Why would God choose somewhere like that? And the announcement probably took place inside in the privacy of Mary's home, rather than somewhere public like the temple, the dwelling place of God. Second, the birth announcement of Jesus is not made to whom you would expect. It wasn't made to the high priest or the governor of the land, but rather to an insignificant peasant girl, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary. It's important to note here that at that time in Jewish society, being pledged or betrothed was as binding as marriage. The couple could only be separated by death or divorce. But there were normally 12 months between betrothal and marriage, in which the young girl would stay at her father's house until she was old enough for marriage. In Roman law at the time, the minimum age for marriage for girls was 12. So if Mary was betrothed but not yet married, it's possible that she was as young as 11 or 12, though she could, of course, have been a little bit older. Why would God choose such a young, unknown peasant girl to bear his son? Why would he ask her to face disgrace in order to fulfil his plan for the world? Why would he ask so much of a girl so young, such a young girl? And Luke takes care here to point out that Mary was a virgin, as this points back to Isaiah's prophecy, which, as we see Matthew also included, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. But of course, when it became evident that Mary was pregnant, while betrothed but not yet married, her virginity would have been called into question by those around her. As Matthew records, Joseph had in mind to divorce her quietly when she was found to be pregnant. Until that is, an angel appeared to him in a dream to back up Mary's story. So it's not surprising that others didn't believe her. So far, we've considered that the announcement of Jesus' coming birth was not made where you would expect or to whom you would expect. And Mary herself would certainly not have been expecting an angel to suddenly appear to her. Remember, until Gabriel's encounter with Zachariah, which Mary was probably unaware of until Gabriel told her about it. There is no record in the Bible of God speaking to his people for about 400 years since the prophet Malachi. And if God was going to speak after such a long silence, why would he speak to someone like her, an unknown peasant girl? So we can imagine Mary's surprise when the angel Gabriel appeared to her with the words, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Indeed, Luke records in the following verse that Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Most people who encounter angels in the Bible seem not surprisingly to be fearful. Earlier in Luke, for example, we read that when the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But what's interesting, I think, in Mary's case is that Luke says Mary was greatly troubled at his words rather than at the appearance of an angel. What was it about the angel's greeting which troubled Mary so much, even before Gabriel went on to tell her the reason for his appearance? Gabriel's greeting to Mary had three parts. The first word, Kyra, simply means greetings that can also mean rejoice suggesting possibly that Mary was expected to respond to the angel's greeting with joy. The second word, kekaratitomini, meaning favoured one or blessed one, emphasises Mary's status as one blessed by God, because God had chosen her. (coughs) Spoiler Gooder points out, Mary was right to be greatly troubled by this, because throughout the Bible, great favour from God, generally comes with great responsibility. And it generally means that your life is about to be turned upside down. Paula Gooder suggests that being assured of God's favour is a bit like the double-edged Chinese proverb, 
may you live in interesting times, which can be seen as either a good or a bad thing. The third part, the Lord is with you, is a wonderful assurance of God's presence with Mary. But as with God's favour, such assurance is offered, often offered for a reason, because God is going to ask you to do something challenging. Gabriel's greeting to Mary has been compared, for example, to the calling of Gideon in Judges 6, when an angel appeared to Gideon and greeted him with the words, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon's response reveals that he certainly didn't see himself as a mighty warrior at the time. So even before Mary has heard what it is God is going to require her to do, she's right to be greatly troubled by Gabriel's greeting. We can only imagine how she must have felt when Gabriel went on to share the next bit of his message with her. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Yet unlike Zechariah's response to Gabriel's announcement to him, when he asked, how can I be sure of this? which led to him being struck dumb for nine months. Mary simply asked Gabriel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Unlike Zechariah, Mary's not questioning whether what the angel has said will happen, but rather she wants to know how it will happen since she's a virgin and not yet married. Now, given all the turmoil that must have been going on inside her at this point, Mary's response to Gabriel's explanation that the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Is remarkable. Mary simply says, Here I am. I'm the Lord's servant. Let it happen to me as you have said. Despite the fact this news is going to turn her world upside down and open her to public disgrace, Mary responds in humble obedience. It's worth pausing here, I think, to consider the extent of the public disgrace Mary was exposing herself to by saying yes to God in this. In first century Jewish society, pregnancy outside marriage was regarded with horror. Mary's reputation would have been in ruins and she would have been an outcast from society. In the worst possible case, she could even have been stoned for it. At the very least, Joseph was likely to disown her. Her parents might have done likewise and thrown her out. Her friends could abandon her and she would be shamed and shunned by the rest of those in her small village. And it was a village everybody knew everybody else. Yet, Mary was willing to risk all this in response to God's message to her and his calling on her life in the knowledge that he was with her, whatever she faced, and that she could trust him. How willing are we to accept and submit to God's call on our lives, whatever that might be, to go where he leads, to do what he asks, to be who he wants us to be, no matter what that might mean for us? Are we willing to say to God, Here I am. Let it happen to me as you have said. Or are we more likely to respond by making excuses for why we can't say yes to God? Forgetting that if we say yes to God, he will equip us and walk with us. Do we trust that God's plan for us is a good one? A number of years ago now, a friend of mine, Liz, and her husband, Andrew, who's a pilot with Mission Aviation Fellowship, felt that God was calling them and their young children to move from Tanzania to serve MAP in South Sudan. But because of the violence and instability there, they were not surprisingly a little bit hesitant and scared about saying yes to God. In her book, Immeasurably More, Liz recounts a conversation she had with a friend at the time who was a long-term missionary for MAF when they're at the point of agreeing to go to South Sudan. Liz writes, 
But Margaret, I confess to her, I'm not sure that I'm brave enough to cope in a country like South Sudan. What if I'm not able to manage? I will always remember her response as Margaret effectively laid down the gauntlet. She gave me a challenge, a challenge I continue to relish. As we walked down that sandy Dodoma road, she looked straight at me and commented, Liz, the question is not, am I brave enough? But rather, is my God big enough? If you have faith in God, in who God is, it doesn't matter how strong you feel. If you have faith in who God is, it doesn't matter how strong you feel. Liz and her family did go to South Sudan and lived and worked there for two years, during which time they repeatedly experienced God's protection and provision amidst all the challenges life there brought, including God's protection when the situation in the country became so violent and unstable that they had to evacuate under emergency conditions to Kenya. God gave Liz and Andrew the ability to cope in South Sudan. Their life there was far from easy, but they put their faith in who God is and he was big enough. Mary too had faith in who God was. She trusted that he was big enough to risk public disgrace for. Is our God big enough? Do we trust in who he is? Do we trust in him enough to say yes to him and to submit to his call to, on our lives in humble obedience as Mary did, as Liz and Andrew did, even if not what we had expected or planned? So we've considered that the announcement of Jesus' coming birth was not made where you would expect or to whom you would expect. And we've looked at Mary's remarkable response to the unexpected news that she was to conceive and give birth to the Son of God. We're now going to look at what Gabriel's announcement tells us about Jesus himself, about who he would be. In Luke, Gabriel tells Mary she is to call her son Jesus. And in Matthew's Gospel, the angel who appears to Joseph tells him he is to give Mary's son the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And in the Old Testament, names given by God always have significance. And the angel's instruction for Mary and Joseph to call their baby Jesus is no exception. <coughs> the name Jesus was quite common in first century Judea, and it means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. It's a Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua, just as Joshua in the Old Testament was born in Egypt to save God's people from slavery and lead them to victory over the Canaanites, Jesus in the New Testament was born to save God's people from their sins. Thus Jesus' name reveals his mission and his identity as the saviour of the world, the long-awaited Messiah. Yet this too was not what God's people would have been expecting or hoping for from their Messiah. <clears throat> They would have been hoping for a saviour who would save them from the oppression they faced under the Roman Empire, who would bring in a new reign of peace, justice and righteousness. Most people at the time would not have been looking for someone to save them from their sins. That was all sorted out in the temple by the high priests. Gabriel goes on to tell Mary, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high because he was and is the son of God himself. We saw last week when we looked at the genealogies that Jesus was from the line of David. David appeared in both Matthew's and Luke's genealogies. And these words indicate the fulfilment of Isaiah's prophecy that he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. <coughs> Jesus would be the promised Davidic king whose kingdom will never end, despite the fact that the Jews would reject and crucify him. 
as Paul writes in Philippians. God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Gabriel went on to say to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. <clears throat> Gabriel's announcement to Mary about the baby she would conceive and bear thus makes it clear that he, Jesus, would be the promised Messiah. He would be the saviour of the world. He would be the king of the house of David and he would be the son of God. And the amazing truth is that although the way in which Jesus lived in Mary as a baby growing in her womb was clearly a one-off event, he promises to live in each of us today if only we invite him in. Max Lucado writes, Christ grew in Mary until he had to come out. Christ will grow in you until the same occurs. He will come out in your speech, in your actions, in your decisions. You, like Mary, will deliver Christ into the world. And we, like Mary, just need to be willing to say, here I am. I'm the Lord's servant. Let it happen to me as you have said. Amen.